Sarah, how about you? Do you have any questions before we? <coughs> Bridget, how about you? It's a statement by Socrates. We'll get to your question in just a moment. <clears throat> just to clarify that particular phrase on the syllabus, I think. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life. It's said by a man some 3,000 years ago named Socrates. I have a niece, and uh, her name is Kiana. She is my sister's daughter. I'm not going to talk about her temperament too much, uh, whether she is wired to be happy, ambitious, or whether she is wired to be discontent and therefore dissatisfying. She has always been very, very ambitious, very athletic. Uh, she is, she just turned 20 a couple weeks ago. She finished, this is her last semester to finish a bachelor's degree from UC Merced. And then she applied to these big schools, Harvard, Yale, I don't know if she did Princeton, Emory, Dartmouth, and she got accepted to uh, Penn. She also got accepted to Brown. She's on waiting list for Yale and I think Columbia. I heard this morning that she has an internship at um, I think Lawrence Laboratory in Berkeley. They may have a branch somewhere in Sacramento, I don't know. Her life is very busy, and I suppose in many respects you could categorize her as a very successful young woman. I have no doubt, and she's been working with senators, you know, uh, ever since she was maybe 14 and a half, maybe younger, John McCain and a few other folks. I'm sure she'll get her PhD by the time she's 25, 26. She'll probably get married, have a few kids, raise her kids the way her mom raised them, very involved, very caring, very responsible. And then she'll get to be about 50 or 60 or 70. It's something that awaits all of us, really. I mean, first you need to understand that this phrase that they just spoke of uh, was told to us by Socrates. First, he's a man. Second, he is 70. Third, he's a guy who never really enjoyed 
anything in, in his physical life. He didn't talk to his wife very often. He didn't talk to his kids very often. And if you don't talk to someone very often, it shows that you don't really care for them that much. You're not that attached emotionally. He didn't really want to make very much money. He didn't care about buying fancy clothes, buying fancy cars. He didn't, he wasn't interested in getting into politics and become a politician and legislating laws. He had a very quiet life, quiet but busy. Quiet in the sense that outwardly, he looked very poor. He didn't have anything. Inwardly, he was very rich. He would always inquire, examine, ask. Okay. And so I'm thinking that perhaps at the age of 40 or 50 or 60, he sometimes sits and says, what have I done with my life? And maybe his answer is nothing. And then he looks at politicians, poets, parents, ordinary people, and says to himself, what have they done? They look very busy. Always getting on a plane, going to this stage, talking to on that stage, talking about this concept, that concept. And in the end, really, what awaits them? Yeah. So they'll pass. Some people will remember them, and eventually they'll be forgotten. What do people really do in their life that has any worth or value? I mean, despite the busyness, life is really quite hollow, empty. It's like a desert, you know? And it's a devastating saying, really, that when you pay attention to this rat race, where people are going, what they're doing, what they're thinking about. I mean, look. Look, I mean, sometimes I know, Bridget, you sit back, you kind of watch me and hear me be animated once in a while with certain concepts. And then you sit back and you say, what the hell is he talking about? Why is he getting so excited? Nobody really cares, you know? Hello. So, me, how are you? All right. Yourself? Fine. I mean, my niece. Okay, so she'll get a PhD. Well, damn, I have a PhD. Okay, so she'll get married. Well, damn, I am married. So she'll have children. Well, I have children. Sure, I am going to kind of impose on these experiences my masculine traits. I tell you, my temperament, my perspective, all the projections I'm about to make, it doesn't amount to much. I mean, it's great to have them. But upon reflection, it's not much. My parents, your parents have done all this work raising you, protecting you. You're now in America, far away from your native land. You're busy with your own life, busy with your own work, busy with your own family. How often do you get a chance to think about your parents, what they did for you? What sacrifices they made? Nothing. And that's how the world is. And I think you'll find a similar, I think, statement in the Gospels. But benefit is there for man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul. Do not store your treasures down here where everything will be stolen from you. And that is what Socrates is referring to. He doesn't need to be a Christian or a Buddhist. He is just a man who reflects. And I think anyone who reflects honestly, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thankful about your health, about the fact that in America, in the land of privilege, you have money, you have a job, you have a family. You can appreciate all that stuff. But upon reflection, you kind of push yourself backwards and say, okay, what have I done? Okay, so you have served your husband, your wife, your children, your boss, your kind daughter, your kind friend, brother, sister, all that stuff. But in the end, reflection will tell you, Bridget, you will be forgotten. Have you done anything that people, people will remember you by? And the answer is no. And the conclusion is, well, I mean, you can kind of take an Eckhart Tolle approach that only live in the moment. Don't think about what's going to happen to you when you die or when you get sick, who's going to remember you if your life has any value. Just seize the moment. Carpe diem. 
Okay. Reflection will say no. Think about your past. Think about what you're doing. Think about the future. Because there are these moments all of us have. You kind of wake up, or maybe you're just running around, you know, in this rat race of life, and you say, okay, where am I going? What am I doing? But you can't really nourish that reflective part of you too much at 10 or 12 o'clock in the afternoon because you know that your boss is waiting for you, that a patient is waiting for you. The reflection kind of is pushed to the background. In many ways, I think, because of Socrates, because he's a man, because he's a philosopher, because of his temperament, I think his statement is really quite remarkable. It's terrifying that underneath all these layers of life, you know, Jamie asked about the function of art in human life and human existence, if that was your question. I mean, consider a man named, say, Thomas Kincaid. I don't know if you're familiar with him or his work. He's a painter. He's a Christian painter, and his paintings are absolutely incredible. They're beautiful. They really, really are. You know, it, it usually takes place somewhere in nature, okay? There is a tiny house, and sitting on top of this, like, rock, surrounded by trees, the sun is out, some clouds, it's very serene, it's very tranquil, and you need to sit back and ask, why would a human being create such a painting, such imageries? But what the hell do you do? You live in Oakland, you live in New York, you live in Washington. How many tree trees do you see a day? Are you living near the ocean? What do you see when you walk out of your door? People running, people anxious, people frightened, people depressed, people lonely. You know? So what do you do? Well, if you live in that particular social environment, you'll just go nuts. So what will you do? You lock yourself up in a room. And thank God that you have this talent to paint. And what do you do? You close your eyes for a moment and you say, okay, I've been to Yosemite, so there are trees. I've been to the ocean, so there is water. I've been hiking, so there is solitude. And deep in the forest, I've seen a cabin. Let me put all those things together. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Peace. Tranquility. Contentment. Satisfaction. You put all those things together, what do you get? You get Thomas Kincaid. And why do you have a Thomas Kincaid? Because deep down, really, you can't tolerate what society has become. You don't want to live in the world of season. There is nothing to like. I mean, walk around Laney College. What do you see? Concrete. How many trees do you see? Five. Do you know what happens to the psyche of the human being when you're always around mechanical things? bricks, when you see people running from one class to another, you wait for them, you say, so how was the class? And they say, man, the class was awful. Where do you go to find some peace? Even if you go to a church, you hear the honk of a car outside. You hear people shouting, screaming. And these days, cars, you know, blast their speakers. Snoop Dogg, Lil Wayne, you know, Eminem, they're rapping about garbage. Even when you go to church to find some solitude, you can't. We have art because life is barren. Consider the Norwegian painter, Edward Munch. Beautiful painting, screen. It's a 19th century man, you should be happy. The Industrial Revolution is at hand. Factories are blossoming everywhere. If it took you 10 hours to bake a loaf of bread, in 10 hours you have 5 million loaves of bread. Be happy, rejoice, celebrate, but no. Because society has now taken a different turn. You're on a bridge, you're all alone. 
You want someone to talk to. There is no one there. No one has time. You want someone to look at you and have this way an act of compassion. Come to you and say, so how are you doing? You look sad. Can I do something? No. They don't even pay you attention. You know, here you are screaming, crying, beating yourself up. Over there people are laughing. They don't even care. What can Edward Monk do? He can't create a social change. You want him to stand up and fight for what cause? Remove racism, remove poverty, remove drug addiction, make schools better, come up with a different SLO, ILO, PLO. It's devastating. So you know what he does? He goes into a room, locks his door, and paints. About modernity has created human beings who can no longer empathize. They're no longer social. Every human being now stands on his or her own. We are now individuals. You have to carry your pain on your shoulders alone. And should you ever experience happiness and share that happiness with your friends, they will envy you, resent you, become jealous of you, and eventually post some nasty things about you anonymously. America, one of the most advanced countries on this planet, has the highest numbers of sick people, mentally, emotionally. Why wouldn't you create art? What can Tupac really do? Well, just string some words together and talk about justice, fairness. That's art. And art is not just about painting. What can Plato do? He locks himself in a room and writes. How devastating can that be? I know you're a religious woman, Bridget. Once in a while you go to church. Why do you go to church? Why not talk to your people? Talk to your kids. Talk to your parents. Talk to your friends. Talk to your husband. Talk to anybody. You don't find anyone. So what do you do? Out of desperation, you run to the church. That's very crafty of you. And who do you speak to? God. Whether God exists or not matters very little. Whether that image that Thomas Kincaid creates on canvas, whether that actually exists, it doesn't really matter. The truth is, very much like Thomas Kincaid, you create this painting within your interior. I'm going to go to church by Lakeshore. I'm going to run. Hello, Matthew. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to cry. And I'm going to pray for a better tomorrow. You're doing a very, very similar thing to what Thomas Kincaid was doing. We do art because it allows us to escape. I mean, look at Sarah. From day one, Bridget, day one. She's had that notebook open. What is she going to do? Just sit there? Be bored? Become anxious? Art. Escape from life. I can change politicians, but I can wrap a few things about politicians. I can't make anyone poor. All I can say is, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Everything we have done thus far is about escaping the realities of life. Because they're harsh, they're difficult. And in the end, what did they get you? Okay, so Malcolm X did all this wonderful stuff. Mahatma Gandhi did all this stuff. Nelson Mandela did all this wonderful stuff. What has happened to music? Feminism. Have you seen videos and how women are portrayed? You would think with the coming of feminism, the porn industry would be shut down. It's prospering. You would think that because of Malcolm X, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Angela Davis, 
Maybe rap music or just music itself would be much more refined. It's becoming much more vulgar. You think with freedom, people would be more responsible about the way they want to use their intellect, but no, it creates for more of a sloth. Aren't you glad you're back, Toby? Imagine if Malcolm or Martin or Mahatma Gandhi or Jesus Christ, if they were to come back to life, what do you think Jesus is going to see? Mannequins. They look like human beings from the back, but when you approach them, there is nothing. So, okay, so you give yourself the label of Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist. Once you be like Socrates, ask some deep, profound questions, you realize, yes, they have a nice title, but they are barren, hollow on the inside. Law of life. This class is so upsetting. I like the trumps. So, Jim, why do we create art? I want to talk about one of my very, very, very good friends. Him and I have hung out in coffee shops at least for a few centuries. Uh, I, of course, never met him personally. I've dreamt of him a couple of times, and they were not very pleasant. Do you know who I'm talking about? His first name starts with the initial S. His last name begins with the initial F. Sigmund. Sigmund Foy. You like him, Sarah. You're familiar with his works. No. The name just tickles you. Yes. Sigmund Freud. Are you familiar with him, with his work, and what he's about art? Well, you can't really talk about art without talking about Sigmund Freud. It's impossible. It really, really is. Go back to one of the cave paintings that were found some years ago, and they say it dates back 30,000. A cave painting in France, a cave painting in Spain, of course, these are all assumptions that scholars have about these paintings, that you find them, you look at the walls of the cave, and you see that there are all these animals. And people have come to, scholars, uh, kind of put these paintings within this particular context. <clears throat> Life is tough. There are no safe ways. 30,000 years ago, there are no Costco's 30,000 years ago. Oops, you just got a text from John. And they have come to the conclusion, it may be wrong, that before men go out hunting, they stand before these paintings, they dance, they have their own unique set of rituals, and they pray to whatever God it is that they believe in, so that when they go out there, they can have a successful hunt. So why is it that people pray? They pray because they're waiting for something miraculous to happen. It existed 30,000 years ago, before Jesus, before Moses, before Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, all those things. Okay. And it's happening today. You pray because you want to fix certain parts of you or your life, or in others.
Freud's father, let me also say this. Freud, temperamentally speaking, is an introvert. He is an unhappy, miserable little worm. That is how he was born or wired, okay? More misery is added to him because his father was a Jew. And he lived in a predominantly Christian environment. And if you have read the Gospel of Luke, Luke is no friend to Jews. Unlike Matthew, the Gospel. So, Jews were not liked. So he sees his father being pushed around. Imagine you're a kid, and your father is holding your hand. And let's say, he says, let's go to Baskin Robbins so I can buy you some ice cream. And Freud, being a young, passionate young man, says, Dad, I want 10 scoops chocolate, vanilla, cookies and cream, or cream and cookies, whatever the case may be. And the father says yes. And so as they're approaching the door, someone stands before them and says, you look like a Jew. Knocks the hat off of his head, pushes the guy down, falls to the ground, the father, what do you do as a kid? The guy standing in front of you is Mike Tyson. What are you going to do as a five-year-old? Get into a ring with him. Your father is humiliated. You realize your father's is incompetent, weak to defend your tradition or your father. You're going to just say, Dad, let's just go home. Just, I'll be satisfied with just seeing a picture of ice cream. I don't need to have ice cream. You know, he saw World War I. I don't know which numbers are accurate, but they say about 70 million people were killed in World War I. Well, damn, what the hell happened, Jamie, to empathy, compassion, forgiveness, turning the other cheek? This is because Religions talk about those things, no? Why do you want to kill another human being? Just forgive them. Remember that, that thing in the Gospel of Luke? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, that is one of the main principles of the Christian message. Why can't people forgive people? And Freud sits and asks, if religion is all that good, Okay. Why can't it help people in forgiveness, in turning the other cheek? It doesn't make you money unless you're a preacher like Joel Osteen. Let's just say he overcame all of his reflective conclusions about World War I and religion. Unfortunately for him, he lived long enough to witness part of World War II. I don't know if you have any brothers or sisters, but if you do, there's a good chance that you love them. You care for them. Freud had a number of brothers, not bro but yeah, he had a brother who, of course, he killed. He assumed that he killed him. Uh, his name was Michael. Uh, when Michael was born, he was the second child. All the attention that his parents were giving to him was transferred to the newborn. And Freud was pissed. So he says that every night he would pray for his kid brother to die. 
so that his parents could love him the way they have always. And so when his young brother, at the age of two, got sick and died, he kind of felt bad. He believed that his prayers were answered, but he saw the agony on you know, his parents' face. He never forgave himself for those kinds of prayers. So he had four of his sisters captured by the Nazis. Starved to death, gassed to death. As a young man, you sit back and you watch your sisters die. A miserable death. What are you supposed to think, Jamie? About the goodness of humanity? About the goodness of religion? About how human beings can ever reach perfectibility? About compassion? Freud also had this other weight on his shoulder, which was he was working with people who were not mentally sound. And he wanted to know why is it that people go sick? Why is it that they go nuts? Why all of a sudden you have this man named Will Smith, you know, and he's loved by everyone. Why is it that all of a sudden the guy goes crazy? I mean, for you and I, it becomes gossip. It becomes tabloid conversation. But for someone like Freud, he really wanted to understand. Okay? How could someone who all of a sudden becomes part of the Nazi movement turn against their own father, against their own mother, against their own brother. If you live somewhere that is deep in poverty, and you see parents struggle, you see kids struggle, why the hell would you want to make their lives worse by introducing them to drugs, to alcohol, to porn, to violence? What is it about human nature that is so corrupt? And then he suffered perhaps the most devastating injury to his psyche, being diagnosed with cancer. There is no cure for cancer. You know. And then you die a miserable death. What the hell do you do with all of this, Jamie? What do you do? You can, you know, change World War II. You can't stop the war. You can't fix someone who is in a mental institute because that's trauma. What do you do? Well, Freud's kind of approach to how you deal with the miserable human situation is the following. Class is boring. How do you make the class exciting? Get high before entering the room. Because when you look at me, you see stars all around me. You can deal with the boredom of the classroom, of the conversation. When you realize that you've made some mistakes in your life and you're just you know, building bricks. What the hell do you do with the cope? To cope with the barrenness, the emptiness, the meaninglessness of life. You get high. And then what happens when you get high on a daily basis? You become addicted. How many problems do you got now? Well, first, you do drugs. Now you're addicted. 
none of those things are going to remove the fact that as a human being you are miserable. And that misery is not going to go anywhere. You're just putting a band-aid on it. It may be true that you're high and life is glossy and great from 10 to 11, but what happens when the high gets low? Well, you see life as crap once again. What do you do then? You do more drugs. And the problem with drugs is that, you know, maybe a bottle used to get you high, but when your body becomes adjusted, when it becomes used to handling a bottle of beer, it's no longer going to get high that easily. Now you need five, then you need 10, then you need 20. And what the hell is gonna to happen to your brain cells? What's gonna to happen to your kidneys? What's gonna to happen to your liver? And eventually, what are you gonna do to society? How are you gonna raise your kids? How are you gonna be with your wife or your husband? How are you gonna deal with your parents? Now you're angry. And what happens when there is no solution to your anger? It turns into rage. And what happens when you're raged? Well, it's America. Every 10 minutes a gun goes off. How many people die? 20.